Victor Catan is the author of From Coexistence to Conquest, International Law and the Origins of the Arab-Israeli Conflict, 1891-1949. He is currently completing his doctoral degree from the School of Oriental and African Studies, University of London. Thank you for watching Palestine Studies TV. I'm your host, Will Yeomans. Today we'll be chatting with Victor Catan, who is joining us from London. Thanks for your time, Victor. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to, to be able to speak to you. As you know, there's a lot of talk about the Palestinian option uh, at the United Nations this September. Well, uh, President Abbas, uh, in, in an op-ed that he published in the New York Times, um, I think a month ago, um, said that the, the strategy and the options that were available to the uh, Palestinians was to seek uh, recognition as a state and membership of the United Nations. Um, uh, President Abbas outlined that he, he wanted to seek full membership of the United Nations uh, in, in the strategy, but there have been a few uh, uh, issues about that because of the uh, possibility of a US veto. So another option which they might consider is upgrading their observer status to that of a non of, um, an observer state. Um, at the moment, they are they have like an observer status as a kind of entity, kind of like a special status which no other organization or state has. Why is the Palestinian Authority considering going to United Nations now? I think there are um, several reasons. Um, I think. Uh, well, these, these studies of the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, which said Palestine is ready uh, for statehood um, by September. Um, and I think it's been a strategy, at least in the minds of most officials, that they would seek this option in September of this year. Um, I think other, I think a, a major issue was the, um, the, uh, that, 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 made the Pal that, that made the Palestinian Authority decide to kind of go, I wouldn't call it unilateral, but to decide to go directly to the United Nations rather than pursue the negotiations with Israel. Partly that's because the negotiations haven't gone anywhere. They're deadlocked. Um, I also think that the uh, back in February when the United States vetoed the settlements uh, resolution, I think that upset uh, a lot of Palestinians and it, and it, it made them re finally realize that the, that the United States is not uh, such an honest broker. And another issue, I think, which had an impact on their decision was the publication of the Palestine Papers um, that was leaked in uh, January by uh, Al Jazeera and the Guardian newspaper, which really kind of, uh, uh, my reading of them was that it showed that the the policy of negotiations wasn't really going anywhere. I think it's, it was clear after 10 years, after 15 years, um, but the papers covered 10 years, that uh, no matter how many concessions uh, the Palestinian negotiators were prepared to make, whether it was on Jerusalem or settlements, uh, the, Israeli, uh, the Israelis seemed never to be satisfied. And I think uh, when those documents were exposed, it embarrassed the uh, Palestinian Authority. So I think that's also played a role. And, and, and another, another issue that I think must be on their minds, of course, is the current um, wave of uprisings going throughout the region in Egypt, uh, in Tunisia, and in Syria, and they must be thinking that they should do something, otherwise you know, they could be next. So I think a combination of factors um, have led to this uh, move. In terms of United Nations membership, how does that relate to uh, the quest for statehood, uh, kind of as a legal concept? Well, to be a, a full member state of the United, to be a full member of the United Nations, uh, you have to be a state. Um, because, because only states can be members of the United Nations. Um, so that's the issue. So, so by implication, by applying uh, for membership, the, 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 the Palestinian Authority, the PLO, are essentially saying we are a state. Um, the issue of recognition is more a matter, I think, of legitimacy. Um, by asking more countries in the world to recognize that they are a state, it kind of gives it a more moral force, I guess. Would it trigger certain obligations on Israel's part that, that it currently doesn't have? Yeah, if you're a state, you're entitled to sovereignty of your territory. You're entitled to your territorial integrity. Um, what that means is that you're entitled to preserve your identity as a state, which means if, if another state invades you or breaches your territory, you're entitled to fight back, self-defense. 
if you've been attacked under the UN Charter, Article 51. Um, so yeah, it would give them that right, uh, at least theoretically. What do you think the PA should opt for? They would be better off avoiding a confrontation with the United States by seeking full membership. That's my personal opinion. I think it would be better, at least to begin with, to uh, seek um, uh, the status of observer states. Um, because UN Charter recognizes that you can be a state, but uh, not a full member. It recognizes non-member states um, and observer states. And then I would, uh, if I were this, if I was advising the Palestinians, you know, you, after you've achieved that uh, goal, um, you could ask states to recognize you as an observer state. And in addition, you could begin um, by trying to apply to join other international organizations, ratifying uh, other treaties, and that might trigger opposition or it might trigger some questions just you know by other states who oppose that view might question whether they are a state and then there might be some opportunities uh to 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 get to for legal remedies so they could uh, uh they could ask the un general assembly to um uh, refer um a question to the international court of justice for an advisory opinion you know along the lines of is palestine a state does it have the competence to join the united nations uh, or another international organization, for instance, or, or does it have the competence to ratify international treaties? So it, it could, it, if they were to pursue that route rather than the Security Council, you know, rather than um, seeking outright membership, um, I think that's a better strategy because I think they have a stronger case and it avoids the political body of, of the Security Council where they would face obstacles. You yourself argued in 2009 that a Palestinian state that is recognized, quote, with its territory partitioned and subdivided into cantons, surrounded by walls, fences, ditches, watchtowers, and barbed wire, would scarcely be a state worthy of the name. You now seem to be saying that the Palestinians should still go for recognition for observer status to the UN as a sort of strategy towards uh, statehood. What's changed? Um, well, I'd say nothing on the ground has changed from, I think, my description two years ago is, is accurate today as it was uh, when I made it. But I think at that time I overlooked uh, some of the advantages of, um, of uh, pursuing the strategy. And the main advantage um, that I can see is it would allow the Palestinians to ratify the international the statutes of the International Criminal Court, right, the Rome Statutes, um, which I think would be pretty significant um, because if it was accepted, um, it, it, the, well, nothing would prevent the court from then looking uh, at allegations that, uh, you know, members of the Israeli armed forces and even, even uh, political leaders have been, um, who have been accused of war crimes, crimes against humanity during Operation Cast Lead. And in other incidents, could be uh, investigated, um, which could have uh, quite potential serious com uh, consequences and maybe beneficial consequences too. It might make Israelis think twice before, uh, you know, using that kind of level of force in the future. Israel at the moment is trying to prevent the Palestinians from being able to have this kind of forum in front of the United Nations. Do you think that they're being effective in their lobbying efforts? But obviously, I, I don't know how effective uh, they're, they've been. Um, I can only, um, you know, hazard a guess from what I read in, in, in the media. Um, from what I've read, I think the Israelis have kind of ruled out most of the developing world, and they're mainly focusing on European countries. Um, but I, to be honest, I, I personally, I might be wrong, but my hunch is I think that the Israelis have isolated themselves um, because of their policies, because of their hardline government, I don't think they're that popular. And at the end of the day, what the Palestinians are asking for is what, um, avowedly at least, uh, the EU um, has, 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 set, has been on the record saying that they support, that is, a two-state solution to the conflict, which you know, explicitly uh, a Palestinian state is, 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 is the result of, of, of such a a solution. So I, I can't see how it would not be in their interests or in their in their policy aims to to support the Israelis in preventing the Palestinians from having uh, a state. What should the Palestinian Authority be doing now, 
prior to September to advance their cause worldwide and counter uh, the Israeli attempts to prevent. Well, I think that they should be um, obviously lobbying uh, their, their, these uh, countries. I don't think they should take any vote for granted. Um, and I, I mean, I've heard that I think Abbas is now in Norway or he's, he's traveling throughout some European country, Italy and a few other places. I understand uh, several other top PA officials are going to India um, and, and, and other parts of the world, Australia. So I think that's the right strategy. Um, uh, but the Palestinian Authority might want to cast its net slightly wider. Um, there's only so many of them and they might want to use... Um, uh, you know, people who aren't in the government but support uh, the Palestinian cause, um, like civil society, um, other other people like in Latin America, for instance, there are many uh, Palestinians in the diaspora who could be put to good use. Um, for instance, there are, I think, last time I checked, um, Honduras and El Salvador haven't recognized uh, Palestine, uh, neither has Jamaica, for instance, and yet in all those countries, uh, in fact, in El Salvador and Honduras, there were at one point in it, their history um, presidents who originally were of Palestinian origin. So, um, you know, there are, there are strong contacts there uh, um, which could be made more use of. In fact, I don't know why when <laughs> these chaps were presidents, the, the Palestinians, they didn't ask them for recognition at the time. I think they've been a bit disorganized. And I understand that the uh, um, some of the recognition documents back from 1988, they've misplaced a few of them and they're trying to find their records and catch up. So I think, you know, it, it's also got to do with a bit shoddy organization, sounds all a bit last minute. Um, now, there's an advantage in that, in that you catch the Israelis off foot, but the disadvantage, of course, is, is, is that they, they may have lost contacts and, and they may have misplaced previous statements of recognition. Speaking of 1988, uh, the declaration of the PLO of statehood in, in Algiers specifically, we had a question from someone on Twitter about how that declaration relates to the strive for UN membership. Of course, in 1988, the, the, the PLO, uh, which was then the only organization representing the Palestinian Authority, didn't exist then, was confined to Tun Tunisia. Uh, and they issued that declaration from a summit in Algiers. And at that time, they didn't have any uh, control over the West Bank or Gaza. Um, so that's a major change, obviously, in the last uh, 20, 20 to 23 years or so. Um, they do at least exercise effective control over substantial parts, not all, obviously, of the West Bank. Um, so I think that's a major difference. Um, I also think that uh, if you look at the country that recognized Palestine in 1988, they were mainly confined to the non aligned movement. Um, and, I, uh, and since then, I, uh, one would expect uh, more countries to recognize Palestine, especially from the EU um, and other countries that ha haven't yet recognized them. So I think the, adva the, the, the advantage I'd say about the Declaration 1988 is that they already have um, over 100 recognitions from that date to build upon. They already have these relationships they, they should be building upon. Um, in fact, they should have been building <laughs> upon them for the last 20 years uh, but um, at least it's, it's something to start with. They're not starting from scratch um, with no recognition. So, so they can, I think they can be fairly sure they should get, uh, you, you read in the Israeli media, for instance, at least 130 recognitions. Um, I think they could aim for slightly more, say 150, 150 for 30 more recognitions than they presently have. Um, you know, they'd be on par with Israel, which would be, I think, quite significant, you know, in the battle for legitimacy, uh, whether it has any consequences, you know, time will tell. Some have expressed fears that the strategy around statehood might preclude uh, a binational state or a one-state solution sort of outcome. Uh, what's your response to that? I mean, there's sort of kind of two responses. One is, well, the Palestinians haven't got uh, their state yet, and they might not do so. But even if they were to have a, have a state, um, it doesn't preclude a you know a, a state from merging in the future with another state. For instance, you had Egypt and Syria emerged in the 1950s, 60s as United Arab Republic. It didn't work, but it's possible. Um, it's also possible uh, for if if we if a Palestinian state does come into existence, they'd obviously have to draft a constitution, and they could state in the constitution that if at some future date 
a majority of people in Israel and Palestine decide to merge, um, that they would that they could do that. Uh, for instance, if you look at the uh, I think it's constitution of, of of the Republic of Ireland, there is a clause in their constitution, um, and, and also I think in in the Good Friday Agreement that if if a majority of citizens of Northern Ireland and the Republic concurrently vote to reunify the island. And then that can take place. There'd be referendums, obviously, for that. So there are ways. I mean, it's not the end of end of the uh, end of the road. Having said that, of course, it might become more difficult if if uh, there are two states and you get very strong nationalism in both states. You could have an India-Pakistan situation. So it can go either ways. But if you want a safeguard, you you, you could draft that into a constitution, for instance. Well, you mentioned that. This might alienate the United States, uh, at least seeking a, a, a real membership. But wouldn't observer status also be opposed by the United States as kind of a, you know, a unilateral Palestinian move that's outside of the context of negotiations with Israel? Mm. Well, basically, the U.S. doesn't have a veto in the U.N. General Assembly, and all it would take is a simple majority vote to uh, get to achieve the status of observer state. Um, so even if the, Ameri- if the US uh, blocked it, um, even if, for example, the US, the Europe, even if the whole of the EU, uh, the US, and say another 20 states opposed it, they, you know, they could still get it through on the assumption that is that, 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 that the so- so-called non-aligned states support them, which I imagine they would. Um, so yeah, that the, the advantage of that is it avoids uh, a U.S. confrontation, and and then later on, you see, if they go the non-observer state route, later on, when perhaps international politics is more precipitous, perhaps Obama is in a second term, feeling more confident. I don't know. Uh, the Palestinians could then seek uh, full membership. You know, it's not the end of the road. I mean, they may say that they want to seek full membership now, even if the U.S. vetoes, and then they could always apply again and again. Nothing prevents an entity from applying again. So um, that might be another strategy. Uh, but personally, I think that avoiding a confrontation is a smarter one, trying to get it before an international legal forum where they'll get a better, fairer hearing is a better option to go for. And uh, perhaps a, a going for the full membership at a later stage uh, might be a better strategy when they've had success perhaps in other forums. So you think there's a high probability of success in front of the United Nations? I think so, because the assumption is that, that most countries do support the Palestinian cause. Um, uh, most members of the United Nations struggled against uh, colonialism. They have a history of that. Um, so they more readily identify with the Palestinian struggle. Um, you know, the Arab League has, or, or the members of the Arab League amount to over 20 states. I imagine most African countries would support them. And we can assume uh, that most Latin American states will support them because there's been a spate of recognitions from Latin America in the last six to seven months. So they have a clear majority uh, of states support the Palestinians out of the 190 now 193 member body. Um, but the issue is in international politics is whether they get the support from the powerful, rich, uh, developed countries, um, primarily North America, the Europe, uh, and Australasia. So. Um, it, the real issue, the real battleground, so to speak, will be Europe. Uh, um, so I think that's where the most the concentration of lobbying efforts will be. And I think that's where the Israelis are focusing. I think they've given up on the rest. They're focusing mainly on the EU countries. Say the Palestinians were successful at gaining uh, observer status. Does this automatically translate into a stronger bargaining position uh, vis-a-vis Israel at the negotiation table? Not in terms of uh, you know <laughs> uh, power as such, but what it what it allows is it would allow the Palestinians to um, to seek support from other states, to maybe to seek a more multilateral uh, approach to negotiations, and to get some of the core issues before an international court. So out of the, the, the unbalanced uh, negotiation structure between Israel and Palestine, the Palestinians could say, look, we've pursued uh, negotiations with you. We've been honest. We've been fair. We've laid everything on the table. We've been prepared to negotiate, but we've got nowhere with that. Perhaps we would have better luck before an international tribunal, which can look at uh, the issues from a more uh, 
let's say, neutral standpoint, at least more neutral than, than the Israeli government. Um, and that might, you know, um, they could then bring that to the table. Um, and, and by bringing this to the attention of the whole world, they might get, gain more support uh, for their position and remind countries of their, of their position. I think a lot of people have forgotten. Um, you know that the Palestinian struggle is, is a long one, um, and that they have a do they do have a strong case, a legal case, uh, in fact, morally and, and politically, but it's just never really discussed. So getting these issues in forums, uh, I think, sh- would prove more successful, of course, depending what the issues are. Um, I mean, if we look at the last time the the first and last time the Palestinians went before the International Court of Justice on the in the advisory opinion on the wall, um, they were they practically you know 14 judges. Uh, ruled in favor of the Palestinian uh, position. And even the U.S. judge who uh, appended a separate opinion agreed with most of the issues. Um, So the assumption is that, I mean, of course, it depends what issues, but I think like a question that relates to the issue of is Palestine a state or or does it have the capacity to to join international organizations and, and, and to ratify treaties? I think the answer is clear that it does, but Getting the ICJ to perhaps say that would, would, would give them a stronger bargaining power, I think, than at the moment, where it's just them and the Israelis, and they're the clear underdog. Well, I want to thank you very much for your time and your patience and for being on Palestine Studies TV. Thank you very much. It's a, a pleasure. <laughs>